Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Southern Fort Wheel Drive Association's TechNet. This is season two, episode three. This is going to be our last episode where we talk about uh, tools, what's in your tool bag. Uh, Mike's going to be showing us actually how to use some of those tools to make some repairs. That's right. I'm going to do my best. I don't have a vehicle here, but I've got some props uh, to kind of show. So we're going to talk about some just basic things that happen to us off-road and how we can fix those to get off the trail. That's the key thing with field expedient repair is we're just making these repairs to get us off the trail closer to a repair station if we need to make a repair or if we can get to a trailer to get towed somewhere. Um, so these are not always permanent repairs. Um, some do last longer than others. But remember, guys, that um, so I can't see your questions. <clears throat> excuse me. But if you have a question, preface it with a Q. And at the end of the stream, Al will ask the questions to me and I will do my best to answer. If I don't have an answer, I'll find somebody that does and we will get back to you as soon as we can. So let's get started. First, let's talk about one of the common issues that we run into off-road cooling. Our vehicles, in order for them to run efficiently, they have to run at an operating temperature. And this operating temperature can be you know, anywhere from 160, 170 degrees up to 210 degrees Fahrenheit. But occasionally, our vehicles can start to overheat and they start to get too warm. Whether they're working really hard, maybe they're in dusty or muddy environments, or maybe we have a problem with the vehicle and we have to make a repair to it. So let's talk about that and then we'll talk about some repairs. So first off, we've got a radiator, right? This is on the front of most of our vehicles, unless you've got a custom built buggy. But this radiator is on the front of your vehicle. On the top, you have a reservoir. Sometimes it's on the side, but on the top, you have a reservoir and on the bottom, you have a reservoir. Newer ones are made out of plastic where some of the older ones were metal. So this plastic can become brittle over time and crack and break. You're going to have a radiator cap on the top here. And then you have all of these fins and these little channels in between these fins. So when your vehicle gets hot and it starts to circulate coolant, coolant can come in possibly the top here, and then it feeds down through these channels and these fins draw the heat off that fluid as the air is moving through our radiator as we're driving, or the fan is pulling air through the radiator while we're driving. So that helps cool the coolant so that it can circulate back through the engine and keep it at our operating temperature without getting too hot. So sometimes what happens is these fins can become dirty with dust or mud and we don't clean them, right? And now they're not working as efficiently. These fins can't dissipate that heat or Sometimes we puncture a radiator like this hole right here and we start to spew coolant out. Now, we can repair a radiator if we puncture a hole in it. Reason being is, is because each one of these fins or these, these channels that travel with the coolant up and down here are separate from each other. So I've got one here where I have a hole, but if I seal this off, then it's not going to affect this channel over here. So you can see right here, I've already kind of made a hole, but let's say, you know, somebody threw a pair of needle nose pliers at you, right, on the trail, and we get a hole in our radiator, and now it's leaking. So we have to seal that channel off. Needle nose pliers are the ideal tool for this, but what we want to do is, is go into this radiator and remove these little fins on either side of this channel. Okay, and sometimes you can do this while it's on the vehicle if you can access it. Sometimes you may need to make some room by taking some things apart. But we need to go in there and remove all of these little fins on both sides of the channel. And once we've done that, again, taking our needle nose pliers, we crimp that channel shut top and bottom as best as we can. And then we take our needle nose pliers and we twist them to seal it off, right? And be gentle because these are very fragile. They can tear, right? We're not super worried about that, but you can see right there, Sarah gets up close how I twisted that one in place. And then we crimp it just a little bit. Do the same thing to the bottom. Rolling that channel back. 
and then I pinch it off. Now, this will definitely slow down the loss of coolant that's coming out, but it's probably not going to seal it 100% because when I crimp it, it's probably breaking a little bit right there, um, but it's, it's probably still going to leak. It's definitely slowed it down, but once this gets back up to pressure because this is pressurized, then it's going to start to spew out coolant again. So this is where we get out our JB weld, right? And I use JB quick weld. It's a two-part epoxy. One is the steel and one is the hardener. So what I do here is, is I'll just put out about an inch long strip of each one. And they have to be equal parts as equal parts as we can. Then I just take a popsicle stick and I mix these together and they're gonna turn kind of gray. And I've got about five minutes before this starts to set up, but I wanna mix it up nice and good, make sure that it gets a good consistent color. And once I do, I can take this popsicle stick right here and I'm gonna smush it in all around where I made that crimp at, right? Go ahead and get as much as I can and smush it in there. That's a technical word, smush it in there to let it seal off. Then I'm going to let it sit for about five to eight minutes, okay? And letting it sit will just allow it long enough to harden. And once it hardens, JB Weld, especially the quick weld, is about 2,800 PSI. Um, after 24 hours, it's up to about 5,800 PSI. So it's going to be strong enough to seal off this radiator. And now, even though I've lost this one channel, I still have all these other channels over here that are going to carry coolant top to bottom and help dissipate heat. So I've probably only lost maybe about 5% of my cooling ability. Another thing that I can do now that I have a leak in there is I can reduce the pressure in my radiator. Now, don't do this when it's hot. You have to wait for it to cool, okay? But radiator caps are two-stage. You have the first stage where you open it and it relieves pressure, okay? It still is on there, but it relieves the pressure. The second stage is to remove it. So if I want to reduce the pressure and not allow the radiator to build up pressure, I'm gonna loosen it to the first stage here, okay? Now, not everybody can do this because some vehicles have radiators that you can't necessarily depressurize or access with a radiator cap. Land Rover guys know what I'm talking about. But the ones you can, if you want to stem kind of the pressure that's in there or slow down the pressure in there so that it doesn't blow out your repair, you can do that and still drive. But keep in mind, now that the system's not pressurized, okay, it's probably going to get hotter faster, right? Because we're actually lowering the boiling point of the coolant because it's no longer pressurized. Now, we've made the rep repair. Once this hardens, we're gonna add something back in here, okay? If you have coolant, great. That's awesome to add back in. Distilled water is best. Um, but if you don't have access to anything, you know, you can pull water out of a stream, but you need to at least filter the large particulates out of it. Remember in the field expand repair kit, those pantyhose I carry, they work great for that, right? So that you can clean your water at least enough to put it in here. Um, and that will get it topped back up so you don't have any air bubbles. But that's a quick and easy fix if you get a hole in your radiator or you spring a leak in the fence. Same thing in the plastic up here. If you get a crack in the plastic, okay, on these reservoirs, you can use the JB plastic weld to repair those. All right, I don't have any plastic weld here and we've got a lot to cover tonight, but you can repair that. It does take longer to set, right? So keep that in mind. All right. The next stage of cooling, and let me cover this before we go too much further, but just keep in mind that once your vehicle starts to overheat, okay, we've seen this radiator here, the very first thing that you should do is, is not turn off the vehicle, but actually turn your heat on full blast. If you turn your heat on full blast, you have another radiator called a heater core that once you turn the heat on, it actually circulates the airflow through, blows the air through that heater core, 
And the same coolant that circulates through this radiator circulates through that heater core. So it's like a second radiator. Now it's much smaller, but that in turn is going to help dissipate a lot of heat. Even if it's 95, 100 degrees out there in Alabama somewhere with Jake from Cardo Tracks, then you still need to turn on that heat full blast. Now, if you notice when you get out of the vehicle that you're losing coolant, you're going to have to go ahead and shut the vehicle down. But when you turn a vehicle off, the temp actually rises a little bit before it starts to fall because it's no longer circulating coolant. All right, next stage in cooling is heater hoses, right? Or coolant hoses. So these hoses typically will come out the top and bottom of your radiator, okay? And you can have different size ones. This one's for a little car, not most of our Jeeps and stuff like that, but they're rubber. Sometimes they can be um, knurled rubber like this right here. And they have metal reinforcement, but nonetheless, they are rubber. So they can dry rot and crack and start to fail, uh, normally at the ends where our connections are made. But if they do split, all is not lost, right? We can make a repair on this and continue on. One of the things that I carry that you guys have seen is this silicone tape, right? And I just get this at advance, but you can get it just about anywhere. Some people call it. Um, rescue tape. I call it silicone tape. It's not sticky. Okay. It doesn't have a sticky side, but it does stick to itself. So if I have a break in one of these hoses, what I do is, is I start to wrap this around as tight as I can, right? To cover up that split. And depending on how big the split is, I may wrap it several times, but this stuff it doesn't have a sticky side, but it adheres to itself, right? Now, even though I still got that split there, this will help hold that pressure. If I wrap this three or four times, it's going to be super strong. Now, this is a big split, right? So most likely the silicone tape isn't going to hold. No fear. I have a fix for that as well, okay? So if you remember, I said carry bike inner tube. So what I'll do if I have a big split is I'll take the bike inner tube and wrap it around tight because this is thicker rubber. So it's going to help to stop it. But because it's not sticky um, and I can't really hold it in place, now I'm going to take my rescue tape. And I'm going to wrap it around the bike inner tube. But I need to start past where I ended on each end with the bike inner tube. And I'm going to wrap it around. Okay. And this gets easier once you get a little bit of this stuff on here. Keep the plastic out of the way. And I'm going to end past where that bike inner tube was. So continue on around until you can't see any more of the bike inner tube. Then just break it off so it pops your fingers and hurts a little bit. But now I've got that big bulge there. But that, again, is going to stop that leak. Okay, and if I have concerns, I can put hose clamps over the ends here and tighten it up real good, and it will hold. I'm not a permanent repair, but I have had them hold for long trips before, right? So even if you do it inside of this metal coiled hose that's got rubber with a metal spring inside of it, you can do the same thing there again, a little bit of bike inner tube around there, and then wrap that silicone tape around it. Nice and thick, right? P for plenty. But this will stop your coolant from leaking and you won't have to replace that hose right away. You can at least get off the trail. Same thing, if we're worried about building up too much pressure, we can relieve that pressure on that radiator cap. So that's how we can fix our heater hoses, which is another common problem that we run into. The last thing I want to talk about is this little guy right here. Okay, This is our thermostat. 
Okay, some may not look like this. This is just a generic thermostat. But this right here is what opens up to allow the coolant to pass through the motor. So this controls basically the operating temperature of the motor. Once it gets to, you know, say 210 degrees, this will actually open up. The spring will compress, allowing coolant to pass through into the motor and circulate. When the temp drops down below whatever the operating temperature of the vehicle is, this will close back up, stopping the coolant from circulating, letting the motor work at its operating temperature until it heats up again. These can get old and freeze, or if you have debris inside of your uh, radiator, things like that, these can get junk and gunk in them, and they can freeze shut or they can freeze open. Obviously, if they freeze open, our vehicle is never really going to get up to operating temperature, but it will stay nice and cool. But if they freeze closed, we can't circulate any coolant because they won't open. Now, these are typically very easy to access, so you can normally two to three volts access these on most any vehicle if you're if it freezes and you can take this out and take it away or carry an extra and replace it on the trail but we can just take it out and do without it okay until we get to a repair store or somewhere where we can repair it allowing coolant just to continuously circulate through the motor but if you do that you've got to have some basic tools box in wrenches or a socket set right Remember what we learned last week about box in wrenches and socket sets from sets from SunX tools. But uh, we can remove these and we need some RTV sealant to seal it back. High temp RTV sealant that I showed you guys in my FER kit because it is uh, something that's got to be sealed with a gasket or it will leak. But you can take these out. And if you're ever wondering if one of these is bad, um, they're kind of fun to test. It's a neat trick to do with kids. But you can actually pull this out and put it in a pot of boiling water. And once it reaches temperature, you can watch it open. It's a pretty neat trick to try. Um, but that's your thermostat. So that's a little bit about cooling. Okay. Next step of this is we're going to talk about tires. Now, in one of our previous tech nets, we plugged a tire. That's fairly basic. I'm going to talk about it, but I'm not going to demonstrate that tonight. But I am going to show you some of the things that can happen to a tire that you can repair on the trail. This especially, guys, is just for fixing it on the trail. This is not a permanent repair style thing. But when we have our tire here, okay, we've got the tread block. This is the strongest part of our tire because it has all those steel bands in there that crisscross, and it keeps our tread nice and stiff and strong. That's why we always try to put our tire on the rocks, not our sidewall, which doesn't have those steel bands and is weaker. But that's why any repair made inside of the tread, okay, and I'm counting just this inner portion right here as a tread, can be a permanent repair. If you take it to a shop and they go through and they actually patch the inside of the tire. If we're plugging a tire, that's no longer considered a permanent repair. If you are trying to get off the trail and you have a nail in the tire, a rock in the tire, or something like that, anywhere in this tread block, even this outer portion here, then you can plug that to get off the trail. If it is past where my thumbs are, okay, just this outer shoulder here, anywhere from this outer shoulder down towards the rim, it should not ever be put on the road because it can become dangerous. So let's talk about, we plugged a tire before, so we're not going to talk about that. But let's talk about if we slice open a sidewall. And somewhere here, ooh, there it is. I've got a sidewall slice. So right here, okay, you can see I've sliced open this sidewall. It could be from a rock. It could be from all sorts of things. Um, you know, maybe I hit the curb when I was rock crawling at the mall in my Toyota, right? Or Jeep, whichever one. Don't get mad at me. But maybe I sliced open my sidewall. Well, if I need to get off the trail, right, I can repair this or at least slow down the air loss long enough to get off the trail. How I do that is, is the same tire plugs that I use for plugging my tire, okay, these sticky little cords right here, that are hard to get out. I'm going to pull out several of these, okay. A lot of times it'll take one of the whole little packets 
here, but I'm just going to show you a couple. But these little sticky cords right here, basically they're rope covered with a type of resin, but I'm going to fold them in half like this, okay? So I'm going to take them, fold them in half, and I'm going to open up this cut, and I'm going to stick them down in there, okay, sideways. And you can use your little reamer tool, right, from your tire repair kit. Everybody carries a tire repair kit, right? You can poke them sideways down into the tire. Got to be gentle so you don't push them all the way through. But I'm going to lay them sideways and using my reamer tool, I'm going to push them to the edge. And I'm going to continue doing that over and over and over until I filled that whole sidewall crack. Right? So again, you're folding it in half. You're taking your little reamer tool and you're pushing them down in there, okay? It's a dirty job, but somebody has to do it. And then you're stacking them on the side. And I'm gonna continue all the way down until I filled that whole slice open. Now, once I've done that, okay, I can put air to this tire now. It might still leak, but it's not gonna be anywhere near as fast. So I can air it up, you know, to whatever the pressure that this tire will hold. And then I can drive on the trail as far as I can, and I'll start to air it up again once it's low. Sometimes I've even gotten this to be uh, completely sealed tight once I air it up, because then, depending on how the cut happens, it will actually seal itself off with those plugs in there. But just keep stacking them in until it slows the air down. The other thing that I will do uh, if I have a really large slice is I might even put a little bit, before I put any air in there or anything, I might put a little bit of rubber, quick sealing rubber cement in there to help slow it down. But that's what I'm trying to do again, is just slow it down to get me off the trail. Remember that tires, when they're wet, super easy to cut, right? If I tried to cut this dry tire right now with a knife, I'd be stalling at it all day long, no matter how sharp that knife is. But the second that this tire gets wet or those rocks that you're on are wet, it will slice right through the sidewall of my tire very quickly and very easily. Okay. All right. Now, the next thing with tire repair that we run into is valve stems. So I've got this little valve stem right here. Okay. And this, this is a bad one. But sometimes what happens is right here, they get cut. Okay, they're on the tire, they get smushed up against a rock here, and when they're bent over, maybe the rock slices them open. If I want to replace this valve stem, I have to debead this tire. Now, to debead it, it's not very hard, okay, but if you do it the wrong way, it's near impossible. Some people will try to drive up on the tire, okay, down here, they'll try to drive up on the side of the tire to break the bead, but the tire pops up and just rolls off. Or they'll try to jump up and down on it. Well, I can promise you, even if you weigh three or 400 pounds, you're not going to break this tire bead. The way to do it, use the weight of your vehicle and your high lift jack and put the foot of your high lift jack on the edge of this tire. Okay. Then as you lift up your tire or lift up your vehicle, it will break this bead down and you can access the inside to replace this valve stem. Replacing these is very easy. It's not a hard thing to do. This little ridge right here is all I have to pop through. You can put a little bit of uh, the tire lube like comes in the ARB tire repair kit and it will slide right into place. Super easy and you've got a brand new valve stem. There are products out there like Colby tire valves and some other uh, quick repair tire valves that you don't even have to debead the tire to replace. Um, but again, this is a quick and easy. I can carry it in my tire repair kit to replace. Another thing that I can do if um, for some reason, maybe the cut happens higher up here, is I can actually take one of these uh, tire plugs like we were talking about earlier, but I can take one of these and I can actually remove the Schrader valve into the center here and I can start to push this down inside and actually feed it through a valve stem to seal a valve stem off depending on where it's cut at, okay? So that's a repair that I can make on a valve stem that's a quick and easy one if I, if I have the ability to without debeating it. So another thing that can happen with tires is called burping a bead. Maybe I go around a 
corner in some mud and I slide sideways a little bit and it will actually separate the bead that's from the rim and it will let a little air out and let some debris into the wheel. Once it does that, when it seals back up, it'll trap debris like sticks and mud and dirt and grime in there. So what I've got to do again is, is if I develop a slow leak from that, I've got to de-bead this tire with my high lift jack and I take my brush here once it's de-beaded and I go around the edge of the rim, scratch it up a little bit and get all that mud, dirt and grime out and I'll wash it off with some water so that I can seal this back and it'll make a good seal on the tire. So that's what um, I'll do for basic tire repair. A lot of people ask me, well, why don't you just carry a spare? Well, I do. I carry a spare. But if I'm on a long trip, you know, maybe I'm out for three or four days. The last thing I want to have to worry about is running out of a spare tire. So if I put a spare tire on my vehicle, I'm still going to make an attempt to fix this tire. Uh, because if I get another flat, I mean, most people don't carry two spares, right? So that's why I always try to do tire repair. Some other little tricks that I do with my tires, especially on my daily drivers, not for you people with dedicated trail rigs, but for daily drivers is, as you notice, you have wheel weights on your wheels. They could be here or they could actually be stuck on the inside is I will mark these on my wheel with a Sharpie or a paint pen. That way, if I jump on the road and I've got that dreaded death wobble, then I can look and see if maybe I lost a weight while I was off road. And I can quickly swing in a tire shop and get my tires rebalanced, right? Because that's how they balance it is with those wheel weights. The other thing uh, I will do before and after, okay, or sorry, after I've got a flat tire and I put my tire on, we learned all about torque wrenches. But again, remember, you've got to properly torque the lug nuts to hold the wheel on. Because last thing we want to do is put on our spare tire. Then we jump on the road and we lose our spare tire going down the road. That's not a fun experience. Ask me how I know, right? All right, I'm going to move the tire out of the way. Let's let's answer Paul's question right here before you go on to the uh, no start segment. What if you have a very small sidewall cut and it holds air? Is it okay to run it till you start losing air? On the trail, yes. On the road, no. Uh, now that's a tough one. Are you talking about a cut all the way through, or are we just talking about like a crack in the sidewall? There, a lot of times we get these slight cuts in our sidewalls that um, are not all the way through. A lot of times they're very superficial. Uh, it depends on which tire manufacturer you talk to about how deep that cut has to be before you replace the tire. Typically, they're going to recommend replacing it. If it's a deep cut, if I can look inside of that cut and I can see any of the polyester bands that are in there um, or any of some tires have they turn kind of white on the inside because the inner part's white. If I can see that, I will replace it. Um, our off-road tires, a lot of times, they're three-ply sidewalls um, or they're really thick two-ply with polyester bands in there and nylon bands. They're very, very strong. But once I can see those bands that are in there, and you'll be able to tell because they'll look fuzzy in there, almost like little fuzzy um, from a sweater or something sticking out. Once I can see those, the structure of that tire is gone and you need to replace it. Mike, would you pretty much always take it to a professional, though, for evaluation if you're going to run yeah. it on the road? Yes, I would okay. always take it to a tire shop, so a tire shop that you trust, right? Go to a tire shop you trust and ask them to evaluate because they will de-bead the tire and look at it from the inside to see the damage, um, and they'll be able to tell. Um, but there is no repair for a sidewall that you can run on the road. Only uh, repair in the tread that you can do for on-road. Oh! Mm -hmm. No start diagnosis. So sometimes we're going down the trail and we decide to stop and take a picture of our tire up on a rock. We're all flexed out and we got to take a picture for Instagram, right? Got to do it for the gram. So. When we do that, then we jump back in our Jeep or our Toyota and we want to start driving back down the trail again, but our vehicle doesn't crank. When we get in that vehicle and we turn that key, the vehicle immediately, if we want to start diagnosing this, is going to give us some cues as to what's going on. If we turn that key and nothing comes on, no lights on the dashboard, nothing comes on, or if we turn that key 
and we get that click, 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 then we probably got a problem with our battery. Okay. Now, looking at our battery here, we've got a positive and negative terminal. Most of us know that, right? Now, typically, I've bought some battery terminals here, but typically what's happened is one of these has vibrated loose, okay, or for some reason is not making a good connection. So we, we can pull these off, right? Just take a socket set or a box end wrench. We'll pull these off and we can clean it because these do get corroded because we've got all of our LED lights hooked up to it. We clean it and put it back on and tighten it back down, right? We want to tighten it down so that it's not wiggling, so it can't vibrate loose. Without a good connection, most likely this battery is not going to have enough power to crank the vehicle. If I get in the vehicle and it won't start, that's the first thing I go to. Now, if I go here and I notice for whatever reason that these are good, Maybe the vehicle's still not cranking. I will take a multimeter or some people can carry what they call a power pro, okay, which can act as a multimeter, but either one, okay, we want to test the voltage of our battery. So you've got black for negative, red for positive. We clip those onto the battery. And what I'm looking for when I clip onto this battery, is somewhere around about 12.3 to 12.8 volts. Okay, with my power probe here, when I push this button, it beeps at me, I'm at 12.7 volts, right? So I know now that my battery's good, okay? But if I check it, and maybe it says 11.2 volts or even less, I've got a problem with my battery and I've got to figure something out. Maybe just maybe I'll get somebody to jump me off with a set of jumper cables, or if I've got a manual transmission, I'll roll start the vehicle by popping my clutch to start it again. So <clears throat> always start. I heard the perfect example yesterday is open the hood and no start diagnosis and look for those big red arrows. And I said, well, what are the big red arrows? And he said, well, it's when you walk up and somebody's in the parking lot and they pop their hood and they put their hands on the hip. And then they say, hmm, why isn't my vehicle cranking? They're looking for a big red arrow saying right here. So the obvious things. So battery is the best place to start off with testing your voltage and making sure your connections are tight. The next step is going into the three things that a vehicle needs to run. That's air, fuel, and fire. Now, newer vehicles, we talked about this in the first tech net of this season, really hard to test, right? First off, the fuel pressure is really high, so you have to be careful of where you're testing that fuel pressure at. Um, the other reason is, is tons of computers on our vehicles, but we can do some things that may be very simple to test some of these theories, right? Maybe we turn the key and the vehicle turns over, right? It turns over and turns over and turns over, but it won't fire, okay? Maybe we're not getting fuel. So how does a vehicle get fuel? Well, it's got a little electronic fuel pump that pumps fuel to the motor. Newer vehicles, the fuel from the fuel pump to the motor is low pressure. Then it goes into um, some type of way that it increases the fuel pressure, and after that, it's high pressure. But if we pull this lid on our fuse block right here, okay, under the hood, and sometimes it's inside the vehicle, but under the hood, it's going to give us a readout inside, and that may be hard to see, but it's going to give us a readout of what all the relays and fuses control, right? And uh, what amperage they need to be. Now, if we're looking at something like a fuel pump or maybe like an electronic fuel injection system, it's probably not going to be a fuse. It's going to be one of those big blocks that's black or blue or brown. That's going to be a relay. Once those relays start going bad, you're going to have to replace them. But here's the cool thing, especially with newer vehicles, is vehicle manufacturers were smart. They said, well, we're not going to use 17 different relays for everything. What we're going to do is we're going to use a bunch of relays that can be cross-used. So if I start looking through this relay box right here, and I say, oh, that's electronic fuel injection, or oh, that's my fuel pump. I'm going to pull that relay, and then I'm going to look for another relay that matches it. 
just so happens on third gen Toyota Tacoma's electronic fuel injection and fuel pump relay, your horn is the same exact relay. So you can pull your horn relay and put it in there to control your fuel pump. Now get in the vehicle and start it again and see if it cranks. If it does, well, then it was probably the relay for your fuel pump. Relays are more likely to go bad than your fuel pump is. Now, so that's just a quick and easy way to test to see if your fuel pump is not working. Maybe, just maybe, another option would be, and this works really well with older vehicles, but you can remove your air intake and spray a little bit of ether in there. If the vehicle fires up and runs for a second, it's not getting any fuel, right? But only do this on gas vehicles, not diesel vehicles. The other thing that I'm going to look at under here when I'm looking at relays and even fuses is I'm looking for necessary things that the vehicle needs to run, not just electronic fuel injection or things like that. But Toyotas also have this other one called direct injection. Now, that's where it actually ramps up the fuel pressure into the motor. So that's another relay that I'm having that I know is important. Typically, anything dealing with um, ECM, electronic control modules, fuel injection, fuel pumps, anything like that, I know that I'm going to need. But things like horns, driving lights, backup lights, things like that, I can pull those relays to replace other relays that are in there. I know going down the road, I don't necessarily need my towing relay, so I can put that in a prioritized one while I'm under there. So that's typically controlling fuel and sometimes our fire, too, with relays. Another thing that you can do is, is now I've got a power probe here, but I can use this to put power to my fuel pump if I want to try to do that. But if I'm unsure, okay, maybe my relay didn't fix it, then I can pull wire out of my field expedient repair kit and I can run a wire from the battery down to the fuel pump at the connector if I can access it and see if that kicks the fuel pump on. Be careful because it's not fused at that point in time, but it at least give you a chance to test that fuel pump. All right, now I'm going to use this hose right here to demonstrate air, right? So our air intake over here sucks air in and it goes into the intake of the motor and that's where it mixes, or the plenum some people call it, but that's where it mixes the air fuel ratio. Normally here at the air intake, we've got something called a MAF, M-A-F, which is a mass airflow sensor. Um, and that senses the amount of airflow coming into the uh, intake and measures it going into the motor. If at any point in time that mass airflow sensor, and this is on newer vehicles, but if it senses any differentiation between here and going into the motor, the vehicle will not run, right? Maybe it's sensing even more air here. It will not let the vehicle run more than just a second. You've normally got a leak somewhere between here and here, and it could be, again, a split in an air intake. How do we fix that? Our silicone tape will fix that, right? So that now, when it's measuring that airflow through, it's going to sense that it's still getting the same amount of airflow once I make that repair. The other thing that I can do is, is obviously check my air filter if I'm not getting air into the motor. I, if I've been in dusty environments, we lost Mike there. I'm sh I'm sure it was an internet connection issue. I'm gonna I'm gonna talk for just a minute and see if Mike comes back. The thing about tread lightly, we need to set a good example so that people will see that we're doing things properly, and hopefully they'll mimic our actions. So thanks everybody for joining. Have a merry 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 Christmas and a great New Year, and we'll talk to you next year. Bye now.